on you for a couple days. Um, <clears throat> I finally updated the board. So your FRQ is next Monday, and your Chapter 9 test is next Tuesday. That reading, um, I know you have a lot going on. The EMSCO book is really important, but for this specific test, if you had to do some reading, do the woodbook. All right, there's a lot of theories and models in the woodbook that need to be read. That's very, very important. Um, okay, so let's jump into this. All right, <clears throat> vocabulary, Kat, I'm gonna have you do the first two. Um, Steph, I'm gonna have you do the next two. Uh, and then Logan, I'm gonna have you do the last three. Okay, all of these words are fair game. Vocabulary is a big deal in AP Human Geography, so it's important that you understand these words uh, and you can relate them to scenarios, questions, etc. Access to healthcare. Uh, the primary use of personal health services to achieve the best health outcomes and second, secondary sector jobs of the economy is in an economic sector and three sector theory, which describes the role of manufacturing. Okay, yep, manufacturing, manufacturing type jobs. Do you understand what manufacturing type jobs are? You have your, yeah, vocab. Um, what are manufacturing type jobs? Okay. Car making. Car making, right? Putting together parts to make a finished product. What else would be manufacturing? What type of shoes are you wearing? Do you think you have to put those shoes together? Yes. It's manufacturing. All right, think about your phones. Do your phones just come together or do you, are there pieces that you have to put together? There are pieces, yes. Uh, everything is involved with manufacturing. Everything that you put together is manufacturing type jobs. All right, the next two. Steph, how about service and then tertiary? trash collection and sometimes the cable bill might even be packaged in that so any sort of business that collects bills from you would be a service sector job okay how many of you have ever got your carpets cleaned in your house okay how many of you have ever got your tile or your grout cleaned how many of you have ever had your plumbing or your pool service at your house? Okay, all of those services, those are service sector jobs. A company provides a service for you and your family and then they collect on the bill afterwards. All right, tertiary, you, you said, you said tertiary? You did, didn't you? Um, all right, quaternary, uh, primary, and the sectoral. Um, quaternary consists of those jobs that provide information services. Primary, it includes activities that directly extract materials from earth through agriculture and sometimes by mining, fishing, and forestry. And the sectoral structure model is a model that says a city develops a series of sectors and operations. Right, now, did they give an example for the quaternary sector jobs? Did they give any examples of that? Like, you said information type jobs, but were there any examples that were given? Um, consultancy. Okay. Um, 
Okay, consulting. Yep. Any any others? I think like computer jobs. Yes. Like mm -hmm. IT, like exactly. IT. If you're um, a lot of times businesses will have technology directors, or they'll have IT support. Have you heard of that before? IT support if something goes wrong. Um, so that would be quaternary. Quaternary type jobs have a lot to do with computers a lot of times. All right, let's jump into um, this next little section here. Um, we'll, go, we'll go group by group. Um, Jackson, would you read, and this should be not global warming, it should be global warming, right? Um, so just read the words and the definitions. Gender index is a measure of the extent of each country's gender equality. Global warming is involved from being a first climate. Gender equity is fairness of treatment for men and women and development indicators of the quality of life measured in a country. Okay, good. So how are these how are these united? Ginger? I said they're related because different countries have different gender equality rights. And according to the UN gender Okay, all right, so the gender index and gender equity, you can kind of bring those two together. Um, the development indicators, a negative impact in terms of where you're at in development could impact the, the idea of global warming. Anyone else want to kind of share their connection sentence there? Yeah, Kat. Uh, these things that the terms have in common are that gender equity is the process and action of being fair to both genders, while development indicators measure the quality of life in, in our region, and global warming could be an indicator heavily pulled into polluting areas. Exactly. How many of you have heard of the word pollution? You've heard of the word pollution? Does anybody know the three main types of pollution today in the world? There are three main types. We haven't talked about pollution yet. That's coming in a later chapter, but does anybody know the basic three types of pollution? Is it liquid, solid, and gas? Um, well, yeah. Air, water, soil. Okay, air, water, and soil. So when you're thinking about global warming, this idea, whether you believe in global warming or whether you don't, um, this idea with development indicators, countries that are poorer could potentially have more pollution and they could be contributing to global warming as compared to the wealthier countries because the wealthier countries have more protection against letting pollution out into the air. Um, and again, we'll talk more about air pollution in a later chapter. All right, we're pretty good good on, on that. Um, hopefully those of you that were updating your connection sentence there um, were able to adjust that. All right, um, Rachel, could you read uh, the next grouping of words here? We have developing UN Millennium Development Goals, Standards of Living, and Economic Restructuring. Um, I wasn't able to do this last night. I can explain to you off the clock. All right, Sarah, could you read those? Developing these different rates of development in different countries, um, UN Millennium Development Goals, trying to illustrate the life expectancy, standards of living, having the basic needs to, of life, economic reconstruction, the structure of the types of jobs. Okay, so how, how do we see these connected? Let's talk through this. How do we see these connected? Where would we start? Developing UN Millennium Development Goals. Those are obviously to help poor countries, right? Development insinuates that you know, poor countries need to help them become developed. Standards of living and then economic restructuring potentially moving money around to help the poorer countries. Steph? I like Sarah like how they all like they kind of branch off developing these things as developing because they're like all showing development in each country and how they're showing stuff. Okay. All right. So 
you're, you're saying we could start with developing, right? Which I would agree. I think you can start with the word developing. What do we know about that word developing? Jackson? Um, that it's like growth and becoming more advanced. Exactly. So it's, it's a country or a state that is impoverished. They don't have much. They don't have jobs. They don't have education. They don't have infrastructure. They don't have roads. They don't have medicine. Um, they have higher starvation rates. They have higher death rates, higher um, all kinds of, of different negative aspects. Um, the UN Millennium Development Goals are meant to help those countries improve their situation. You look at standards of living, what is standards of living? And I, you know, I'm not asking for another definition, but just thinking about it, what, what does standard of living mean to you? Um, like kind of having enough like money to be able to like afford like things in your country or I guess you're like, I mean, all of you have a standard of living that you live at right now with your parents, right? I mean, they provide a standard of living for you. As you get older, your parents will have less impact on that, and you will be the ones that will have to provide the standard of living for yourself. Right now, your parents are providing a bed for you to sleep on, regular meals, vacations, paying for fun weekends with friends, you know, things like that. They're providing a very good standard of living for you because you are under their roof. When you get to be my age, when you get to be an adult, your parents don't help out with that stuff. It's up to you to be able to take care of that. So standard of living, does everybody have the same standard of living? No. So the standard of living in a developing country is gonna be a lot less than the standard of living of someone living in a developed country. So you can see standard of living can tie back to developing. And then this idea of economic restructuring, what are we talking about there? Economic restructuring. Can you read that definition again for me? Who was, Sarah, nice and loud? I don't think I have this right, but I put the structure of the types of jobs. Okay, I, I think we can go a little deeper um, I said used to indicate changes in the constituent parts of an economy. Okay, so changes in parts of the economy. All right, one of the things when you restructure, if you restructure something, do we understand what that concept means? If you restructure something, what are you doing? Refixing or rebuilding. Yeah, you're rebuilding or you're moving around parts, right? A lot of times in business, a lot of you, when you graduate college, you're going to go into business. You're going to be a part of a business. Well, what happens a lot of times in a business is when someone retires, they move people around in different positions in the company. That's what's called a restructuring. Well, economic restructuring can go back to developing because a lot of times in the world, every once in a while, there's kind of a reset where countries move around in terms of the amount of money and resources they have, and then they can help the poorer countries. So economic restructuring could be a way to help boost the development of developing countries. So I'm not telling you what to write, but I'm saying you want to start with developing, and you can build the other words around developing, okay? So those of you, your papers I'm collecting tonight, make sure that's where you're at. All right, um, Kat, how about these words here? Malaria, desertification, human development index, and income distribution. So malaria, a human disease that is caused by spores and parasites in the red blood cells. The certification, the process by which fertile land becomes desert, typically by result of a drought, deforestation, or inappropriate agriculture. Human Development Index, a summary measure of average achievement and, and key dimensions of human development and income distribution. 
covers how the country's total GDP is distributed amongst its population. Okay. So how, what, where could we start with this? Um, I kind of put that it's kind of somewhere kind of like kind of developed around the HDI, and I put like the desertification. Um, when the land becomes desert, you can't really build anything on it, so that's just like its development. And malaria, like when people die, that's also affected the land. And where would you typically see malaria on the HDI index? Would you see malaria widespread? In very high developed countries or low developed countries? Mm -hmm. Low, because they have a higher volume of disease. So Jackson's on the right track there. Um, malaria would definitely be in the lower developing countries. How about the idea of income distribution? Where would that kind of plug in there? Well, I said in the HDI measures how well countries are doing. More developed countries are going to be richer in healthcare. Malaria disease is mostly wiped out because of the good health care, but in less um, developed countries, it's still a problem. Yeah, exactly, and th that's, that's excellent, Sarah. A income distribution um, has to do with the GDP, the gross domestic product, all the money that is within a country. What did I tell you about the GNI or the GDP? Okay, and this goes back to the Human Development Index. If those numbers are higher, in a country, what does that tell you about that country? It's stable. Exactly. Yeah. It's well off. It's stable. They're doing great. The people in the country have money. They're surviving. Their standard of living is quite high. If the GDP or the income distribution for the GNI is lower, it's a low number, what does that tell you about the development of that country? The numbers are low. James? Well, are the country isn't doing as well. Yeah, the country is more than likely a low developing country, which means they are um, extremely poor and, and they probably need some help. So this idea of income distribution, that ties in directly to the Human Development Index because that helps you identify students if a country is low developing, medium developing, high developing, or very high developing. That really helps you figure that out. Are, are you, you with me? Okay. All right, let's look at the next one. We've got one more after this. Export-oriented industry, Mount Guadores, microcredit program, structural adjustment programs, consumption patterns, complementary regions, and periphery. Well, then you want to read the definitions. Um, uh, Export-oriented industry is an industry mainly concerned with the export of goods. Microdoors uh, are plants in Mexico near the U.S. border. A micro credit program is a provision of small loans and other financial services for individuals and small businesses in developing countries that are unable to obtain loans from commercial banks. The structural adjustment programs uh, include economic goal strategies for achieving objectives in an, in an external financing environment and consumption patterns are the pattern in which individuals identify, purchase, and consume products and services with their communities in a complementary region of a region formed by a combination of two areas with different activities or strengths, each of which benefit them from the other. Okay. Now I'm going to help you on this one because this one is really hard. Okay. As you look at this one, there's not really a word, and sometimes these definitions will do that. There's not really a word that you potentially could build around. These words are actually describing a type of country dealing with development. Do you think these words are describing more of a low developing country or more of a high or very high developing country? Low. They are. When you talk about 
a microcredit program. A lot of low developing countries need to get loans. Do you understand what a loan is? Okay. This would never happen, but hypothetically, if you came to me and said, hey, Mr. Crane, I need to buy lunch today, um, could you loan me $10? I would say, okay, if I need that $10 tomorrow, I would give you that money, okay? I'm giving you that money, I'm loaning you that money so you can go get lunch, and then the next day you come back and pay me. Now, you know the difference, this is just an economics question, and Kiefer will talk about this in three years when you're in this economics class, but full free economics lesson because it popped in my head. You know the difference between a loan and a grant? A loan is I, I give you the money, you have to pay me back. A grant is I give you the money for free. You don't have to pay me back. And there's no interest. That's kind of the difference. So when you're applying scholarships, if you can get grants, that's a plus. If you can get loans, you got to pay them back. Grants are really good for scholarships. Alright, so you got to tie all those in to the idea of a developing country. Okay, all of those words, all of those concepts relate to um, a developing country. That one was a little um, how about this last one here? North American free trade, deindustrialization, outsourcing, core countries, economic sectors, globalization. Um, is there any, Ginger, could you read the definitions of those words? Um, NAFTA's North American free trade agreement that is between the US, Canada, and Mexico to trade with each other. Deindustrialization are areas becoming less industrialized is moving operations to different countries for cheaper labor costs. Poor countries are countries that are the most developed with the strongest economies. And economic sections are areas that have a large economic presence, like big cities, and globalization are, are actions that involve the entire world. Okay. So, again, how, how are these connected? How are these connected? Okay, so you could start with globalization. Um, outsourcing could help with globalization. Do you, do you understand what the idea of outsourcing is? Countries move jobs to other countries. Okay, like so for example, the United States might move jobs to Mexico. Why would a company do that? Why would a company take away jobs from Americans? Well. They want to pay the Mexican people less. So they move the jobs to Mexico, and Mount Cuadora is right across the US-Mexico border. They can pay the Mexican people half, and they can still charge high rates for their product. What does that mean for the company? More cash. They make more profit, because they're paying the people less than what they would have to pay the American people. All right. So but by moving businesses to other countries, that helps with globalization. Core countries would be the wealthier countries. So the wealthier countries, a lot of times the core countries will outsource or they will move their uh, jobs to other countries. It's a little cheaper. Economic sectors deals with the idea of um, Development, all right? Wealthier countries are going to have stronger econ economic sectors, more jobs. Poor countries are going to have weaker. Um, last two words here deindustrialization. The idea of deindustrialization is when you are, deindustrialization is the opposite of industrialization, all right? In industrialization, you're building factories, you're building businesses you're creating jobs. When you outsource jobs, 
where are you going to end this string? It's the process of deindustrialization. If you are taking away industry from one country and moving it to another, that's deindustrialization. Because you're taking away jobs, you're taking away the factories, you're taking away the businesses, and you're moving them overseas, or you're moving them to a poorer country. All right. And then this idea of North American Free Trade Agreement, do you know the three countries that are a part of that? Exactly. Canada, Mexico, and the U.S. Canada and the U.S. would be developed countries, or MDCs. Mexico would be an LDC. So in this case, the North American Free Trade Agreement is an example of globalization and outsourcing. Because both the United States and Canada outsource jobs to Mexico. Why do they do it? They pay the Mexican people less and they can make more money for their product. And the rich executives get even richer <coughs> in the company. So in this particular grouping, North American Free Trade Agreement is an example for globalization and outsourcing. Globalization is the pretty shiny object on top of the surface. The dark, kind of nasty underside is the outsourcing because you're hurting families and the people in the poor countries. They have to work long hours, the safety conditions, the health conditions are not good in the factories, and they pay them terribly. So outsourcing is not a good concept within human geography and development. All right, last two, uh, let's look at A and B, economic indicators and development models. All right, a lot of good ideas here. Economic indicators. Um, Steph, I'm going to have you do gross domestic product, gross national income, GNP per capita, and literacy rates. And then Kat, I'll have you do from international division of labor, labor intensive industries, empowerment of women, and fertility rates. conception of economic production as intrinsically transnational and as intrinsically independent on labor power. Um, intensive industries, industries that produce goods or services requiring a large amount of labor. Empowerment of women is the process of empowering women. Fertility rates are the number of live children born to women of the age in question in the poor of the U.S. Very good. All right, development models. Um, Logan, I'm going to have you do modernization theory, dependency theory, and agglomeration economies. Okay. Um, Ginger, I'm going to have you do European Union, Wallerstein's world system theory, and Weber's model of industrial location. And then Sarah, I'll have you do Ross style stages of economic growth and trading blocks. Modernization theory says traditional societies were developed as they adopt more modern practices. Uh, dependency theory is the notion that resources flow from the periphery of poor and underdeveloped, underdeveloped kids to the core of wealthy kids. Okay. And then yeah, I'm sorry, go ahead. Agglomeration economies is the benefits that come when people locate near one another in cities and industrial clusters. All right, now I want to I want to pause here because I want to touch on this modernization theory and dependency theory. Both of those theories are talked about in your wood book. Okay, I would take some time over the weekend before your chapter nine test on Tuesday to read up on those. All right, both of those theories will be on your test. 
All right, so those are very important to understand. They are very different. Um, so an agglomeration, um, agglomeration, a good example of agglomeration is an easy definition for, for agglomeration is this. Businesses cluster together. For example, um, car companies, Ford. Do you know where Ford is, state, is uh, headquartered today? What state? Ford is headquartered in Michigan. So in Michigan today, that's where all Ford, or the majority of Fords are made in the country. They're shipped out from different huge plants in Michigan. Right around the Mich right around the Ford plants, they have um, other very important companies that are tied to the making of cars. For example, windshield manufacturers, tire companies, um, other car parts companies, and they're all clustered around the car plants. Now, why do those other manufacturers do that? Because it's easy for Ford to go to those different manufacturers and say, okay, I need 50,000 tires, okay? And you complete the sale. I need 100,000 windshields, all right? So the clustering of all those smaller companies around a larger company is what's called agglomeration, okay? Because those smaller companies are contributing to a finished product a Ford car or a Ford truck. Does that make sense? That's a really big fancy fan geography word, but it's important. It was on the exam last year, the word agglomeration. All right, next one, European Union beyond. The European Union was a union formed to heal scars from the world wars and to promote economic growth in Europe. Flourish teams, world system theory, divides countries into three different groups based on political power and not population. In Weber's model of industrialization, it's that there's three factors that influence an industrialization, which is transport costs, labor costs, and location. Okay, I wanna to touch on something that Ginger said because these are two very, very important models. Wallerstein's world system theory. Ginger said that there were three regions Wallerstein, when he came up with his theory, said that you have the core countries, you have the periphery countries, and then in between you have what's called the semi-periphery countries. If you want to read about that in your woodbook, it's a very good little summary of Wallerstein's um, world systems theory. There is one or two questions on your test on Tuesday about that. Also, Weber's model of industrial location there is also a couple questions on the test on that model as well. So that's why I'm saying if you have to choose one of those two books to really pour your energy in and reading, I would definitely choose the wood book for this particular test. All right, and the last two, Rostow's and Trading Fox. Maxwell's stages of economic growth includes the five stages, the conditions for the takeoff, takeoff, drive to, Maturity, an age of high mass consumption, and trading blocks are elaboration of trade within the region. Good. Yep, and more than likely um, tomorrow we're going to talk more about Rostow stages of um, economic growth. We're going to get into that tomorrow uh, when we talk about um, Rostow. And we're going to be comparing Rostow's model. Uh, to something called the self-sufficiency model. So we'll talk a little bit more um, about that. Um, those of you that have your vocabulary, um, if you would please make sure they're together or they're stapled, and if you would just pass those up to the front of your row, and then Jackson, if you wouldn't mind just collecting those um, for me.
don't worry about them. We're all living in this. But no, no pressure. But don't hurry. Um, in your books, would you please open up to page 316? We're gonna tomorrow we're gonna finish key issue three, and then we're gonna get really far into key issue four. That's what we're gonna be doing tomorrow. We'll finish key issue four the first thing on Friday before we do some review. Um, my goal is to have some time to talk to you on Friday about your FRQ um, so that you have some opportunity over the weekend to kind of have some helpful hints. Um, for that, but page 316 and 317, I want to just give you some um, pictures, some maps to kind of highlight, to make some little notes. Uh, I'm going to do that for the rest of the chapter. Kind of take some time to do that today. So, figure 9 30 uh, is bolt production. If you would just highlight that. Figure 9-31 is petroleum production. Um, if you would highlight that. And then also figure 9-32, natural gas production. Those are our three. Just to know what countries have more uh, in their supply than others. Uh, figure 9-33 specifically with the United States, this is where our natural gas fields are located in the U.S. So you see the dark red is where there's actually proven reserves. We talked about that yesterday, the idea of proven and potential. And then the light red is where there's potential reserve. That's where we haven't um, developed yet. But there could Pardon be interruption for two quick for announcements. Natural Boys Bible study yes. grades 9 through 12 are meeting today during lunch in the lecture hall. Boys Bible study grades 9 through 12 are meeting today during lunch in the lecture hall. And if the following students could please stop by the high school desk before lunch, Caleb Worley, Caden Stout, Joel Slater, Walker Wittenborn, Olivia Villarreal, CC Villarreal. Caleb Worley, Caden Stout, Joel Slater, Walker Wittenborn, Olivia Villarreal, and CC Villarreal. Thank you. Um, on page 318, if you would highlight figure 9 34, it says proven reserves of fossil fuels. This kind of shows you there's a little uh, circle graph for each coal, natural gas, and petroleum, and this shows you places in the world where it's in abundance. Um, all right, flipping the page to page 322. 322, um, figure 9 41. Uh, one of the things we're going to do tomorrow before we get into chapter or section issue four is we're going to talk about different types of power. And one of the types of power where you can get energy is nuclear power, right, from nuclear plants. So electricity from nuclear power is figure 9-41. And then figure 9-42, nuclear power by U.S. states. So those little red dots signify where there are nuclear power plants. So if you look at Florida, we currently have five of them. We have five nuclear power plants in Florida. Did you know that? Pretty cool, but some states have none, right? Some states have none. So um, nuclear power is, is something that helps to power our great country. Flipping the page, 324, um, 325. If you would highlight figure 9-44, there on the bottom, electricity from hydroelectric power. Water, but you, you probably knew this, water is a great 
producer of electricity. They actually get electricity from water. Um, and we have major producers of uh, electricity. The TVA, the Tennessee Valley Authority, powers by water, powers electricity for Tennessee, parts of Georgia, the Carolinas, a huge part of the South is powered by water. And the TVA, the Tennessee Valley Authority, is in charge of that. So we even have that in the United States. Um, figure 9-45, biomass fuel in Brazil. This is really interesting. Ethanol is a, is a form alternate of gas that you can put into cars, made more of different vegetable type products. Um, figure 9-45, wind power. You know what's very interesting? Wind power is very big out west. Have any of you ever been out west and seen the big uh, wind turbines kind of in the desert? That's pretty cool, isn't it? And you're just driving along and then here are these huge wind turbines. A lot of the wind power that we have is seen especially out west. Um, okay, and then if you flip the page on page 327, um, figure 9-48 and 9-49, we'll talk about solar energy uh, and the importance of solar energy uh, in in our country today. Okay. Um, so. All right, so uh, we will, tomorrow in class, uh, we will finish Key issue three, we only have three questions left, and then we will dive into key issue four, um, and where we're going to be looking at Rostow's model of development versus the idea of the self sufficiency model. So we'll look at that, we'll get a great start on key issue four, and then on Friday, I'll be able to finish um, the key issues, maybe take a few minutes. Um, if you would on Friday bring your wood book with you, I don't know how many of you bring your wood. This is not required that you bring this every day, but on Friday if you would bring it, because I'd like to show you where some of the models are that I want you to focus on on the weekend. Um, so bring this book with you. Everybody have this book? Okay, and then I'll give you some helpful hints on the FRT. So the next two days are going to be pretty busy as we in a whirlwind finish chapter nine and, and get us ready for Monday and Tuesday next week. All right, any questions that you have for me in terms of kind of the schedule? Um, if, if you have questions on your FRQ, um, please come and see me. Don't, don't hesitate to ask me questions on your FRQ. Is there anyone that has already kind of looked at it, kind of started mapping out ideas? Still have time. That's the good thing. All right, bell rings. Enjoy your lunch. James, um, Paul, go ahead, Lance and Kat. You, you, you two stay back. Um, 